We are obsessed with a digital echo chamber and we expect instant answers. Some problems need 200 pages to explain instead of 143 characters. And so I, I think that illustrates beautifully what the purpose of academic conferences and discussions are. So it's delightful to have you here. Thank you. Dr. Mike, our uh, second two speakers are longtime experts in presidential politics, and um, this is at least, I believe, for each of them, their second, if not third or fourth presidential conference. Third for Barbara, maybe fourth for Mike. Third. Yeah. So Professor Michael Nelson is the former, former, former professor of political science at Rhodes College and senior fellow at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. He is the author of so many books and series and uh, editor of so many series on the American presidency, including the Landmark Presidential Decisions book series for the University Press of Kansas and the American Presidential Election series for the University Press of K Kansas. Uh, among his notable many publications, in 2015, the American Political Science Association gave Dr. Nelson the Richard E. Neustadt Award for outstanding the outstanding book on the presidency and executive politics published in the previous year for his study of Richard Nixon, Resilient America, Electing Nixon in 1968, Channeling Dissent, and Dividing Government. Um, a survey of college textbooks on the American presidency rank two of Dr. Nelson's books in the top five, The Presidency and the Political System, which is actually ranked first, and I believe that is in its 12th edition in 2020 from CQ Press, and The American Presidency, Origins and Development, um, 1776 to 2021 with Professor Sidney Milkis, which I believe is currently in its ninth edition with CQ Press. Um, Dr. Nelson has uh, published Cornell University Press books on two presidents in uh, the University of Virginia's Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, 41 Inside the George H.W. Presidency with Dr. Perry, and um, Inside the Bill Clinton Presidency with Dr. Perry and Russell Riley. Uh, he's published many other books about Frank Sinatra, the military academies, liberal education, baseball, football, and music. Um, we'll focus on the president today. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, Mike, for joining us. Uh, and these are just the abbreviated bios of giving. Dr. Barbara Perry is the Gerald Belilis. Did I get that right, Barbara? Belisles. Belisles. Okay, I, used to I say <laughs> rhymes with smiles. There it goes. Okay. <laughs> Gerald Belisles, professor and director of presidential studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, where she co-directs the presidential oral history program. She has authored or co-authored more than a dozen books on presidents, first ladies, the Kennedy family, the Supreme Court, and civil rights and civil liberties. For the University of Virginia's Miller Center Presidential Oral History Project, she's conducted more than 120 interviews with public officials who served in the George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and um, uh, Obama oral histories. She participated in the Clinton interviews, directed the Edward Kennedy Oral History Project, and co-directs the Hillary Rodham Clinton Oral History Project. She's also an expert scholar on the US Supreme Court and served as a Supreme Court fellow working for both Republican and Democratic members of the Senate. Um, during her time as a Supreme Court fellow, she briefed, uh, in addition to providing research for Chief Justice William Rehnquist's speeches, she briefed more than 3,000 visitors to the court from 70 different countries. She has participated in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of International Information Programs and lectures for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. Uh, again, the Publication record is so long. She's a frequent commentator in presidential politics. I will uh, refer you to her online bio for those specifics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Perry. And with that, we will begin with opening remarks from each of our three speakers. We asked, um, and you're welcome to stay at the table or come to the podium. Uh, we've asked uh, Representative Israel to speak about the Obama presidency from a congressional perspective. 
Um, a behind the scenes view of what was happening in the Obama administration from the perspective of a member of Congress. We've asked Dr. Nelson to begin by discussing the Obama election victory in 2008, how that happened and what that means for American politics. And Dr. Perry to discuss how we assess a presidency and how archival records, oral histories, and discussions such as this one inform our scholarship about and assessments of the presidency. So we'll start with those remarks and then Dr. Himmelfarb and I will lead a discussion followed by questions. How about a big hand for Dr. Bose for everything that she does? <laughs> Thank you so much for your work. And it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a congressman, but we have a president here, President Poser. That's a much <laughs> a, a bigger deal. I, I have made the transition from Congress to the classroom uh, at Cornell University. And my first discovery, uh, Madam President, is that the classroom is far more treacherous, <laughs> far, far more difficult to navigate. And Provost Reardon, it's wonderful to see you. It's uh, wonderful to be with my fellow panelists. Uh, it has been a whirlwind 12 hours for me. Here I am talking about uh, the presidency of Barack Obama. Less than 12 hours ago, uh, I was at a similar conversation that uh, Cornell, uh, my Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University sponsored in Oyster Bay with Reince Priebus, uh, the former chief of staff to former President Trump. Slightly different perspectives. Now I'm back in my comfort zone, I, I have to say. Uh, the last time that I was at Hostra in connection with Barack Obama was the debate uh, in 2012. I was the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee at the time. Served 16 years in the United States Congress. Uh, six of those in the House leadership. Uh, Dr. Reardon, uh, President Reardon earlier this morning uh, was kind enough to uh, share some some remarks about me, and uh, Dr. Bose uh, was kind as well, but they left out the most important part, I, I must tell you, and that is that um, I left Congress after 16 years undefeated and unindicted. <laughs> and that is a triumph uh, in this day and age. Uh, and uh, I know I have 10 minutes, eight minutes left. When, you're, when you leave Congress, you can actually confine your remarks to the amount of time that you're given. Uh, but I do want to share this uh, behind the scenes story with you before we transition into some perspectives on uh, President Obama. When I left Congress, uh, the sergeant at arms called me into a meeting. When you arrive in Congress, you uh, attend an orientation where they tell you all the things that you are expected to do and can do and shouldn't do as a member of Congress. When you leave, you have what I call a disorientation where they brief you on all the things that you can do or can't do as a former member of Congress. This is absolutely true. So I'm sitting with the Sergeant at Arms and he says, well, Congressman, the first thing you should know is you have the title Congressman for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, he said, and secondly, as long as you're not a registered lobbyist, which I'm not, you can come to the Capitol building anytime you want as long as you have your pin on. The reason I have my pin on is because I'm rushing to the airport after this to fly to Washington and need to enter the building. Uh, he said, you can go to the floor of the house whenever you want. He said, uh, you can still use the member's gym also. And that parking spot that you have, you can still use that. And I said, well, I just, let me ask you this. I'm still called congressman. I can still walk into the Capitol building 24 seven. I can go to the floor of the house, the members gym. I still get a cool parking spot. What can't I do? And he said, well, obviously you can't vote on the floor of the house. And secondly, you're not allowed to raise money unless you declare that we're running for Congress again. And I said, I gotta tell you, if I knew this 16 years ago, I would have retired 14 years ago. <laughs> Um, in my time uh, in, uh, in the Congress, I served under two presidents, eight years with George W. Bush, eight years with President uh, Obama. And I want to begin sharing some behind the scenes context of the Obama administration, but in the Bush administration. I want to tell you about one of the most riveting days that I experienced. I had, this is 2008, a warm September day in 2008. It is in the Bush administration. I had been a member of Congress for seven years. I remember vividly sitting on my patio in Dix Hills 
on a Sunday, enjoying a, a beautiful, warm fall twilight. And my phone rang, my congressional phone, and I was told that there was going to be an emergency conference call of every member of Congress with President Bush in a half an hour. And no matter what we were doing, get on that call. And so I called in, we had security codes, and found myself on a conversation with then Secretary of Treasury Paulson. What I didn't know was that several days earlier, specifically on September 18th, Treasury Secretary Paulson called Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. And he said, Madam Speaker, we may have a crisis that we will not be able to solve. This is days after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. And she, but the speaker said, and this is documented, by the way, and I commend to your attention a wonderful book by John Lawrence, who was uh, Speaker Pelosi's chief of staff at the time, called Arc of Power, which I use in my classroom. She said, well, if there's a crisis, why are you calling me? And the Treasury Secretary said, well, the White House wouldn't allow me to call you, so I'm doing this on my own. We need to act. And the speaker said, well, this is a Friday. The members are all in their districts. Why don't we meet on Monday? And the Treasury Secretary famously said, if we wait to Monday, we may not have an economy. If we wait until Monday, we may not have an economy. And so we are on a conference call on Sunday with the Treasury Secretary, where he is explaining for us the imminent almost inexorable collapse of the American economy as a result of the failure of financial services institutions. And I've thought a lot about that one day because that day led to an agreement by the Congress on a conference call that we would support TARP, which actually was defeated on the first vote as the Dow Jones was plummeting 800 points on CNBC, the split screen showed the, the TARP vote going down initially, but we've ultimately passed TARP, which fueled deep economic resentments across the electorate, which led to the election of Barack Obama in a referendum that was about hope and change, but the hope and change didn't come fast enough. It couldn't possibly come fast enough in two years, which led to the election of the Tea Party Congress, which brought the, a Republican majority with a speaker who had no control of the majority, which led to shutdowns and chaos and institutional failures, which all set the stage for the election of Donald Trump, in my view, in 2016. And so, the political terrain for the Obama administration was set even before the inauguration, even before the election. Now, let me share three or four very quick inside perspectives. One is what it was like to observe President Obama's relationship with Congress as an unknown junior rank and file member of Congress. The other, what it was like having amassed some seniority. The third, what it was like being in the inner circle of House leadership, briefing him in the Oval Office frequently. And the fourth is a personal story, and I promise I'll do this in five minutes, I promise. One of the criticisms of the Obama administration, and he would be angry, he would be annoyed with me for sharing this, was that if you were a rank and file member, you were, you were unknown to the White House. George W. Bush, I disagreed with him fundamentally on virtually every policy but he worked every member of Congress. He used the White House as a, a platform for social engagements. He got to know members of Congress. Not so much in the Obama administration. I was a rank and file member. I also endorsed Hillary Clinton, so it's not like uh, President Obama was, you know, couldn't wait to invite me to dinner. And so it took me a little while to kind of get on the runway to a personal relationship. The first official and fairly small meeting I had with President Obama was on the issue of U.S.-Israeli relations. He had gone to Cairo in his first trip. I was very, very active on U.S.-Israeli relations on uh, the uh, Armed Services Committee, where I focused on security issues in the Middle East. And tensions were simmering with the Jewish community and the president. 
Jewish community felt that the president was um, walking back America's historic commitment to Israel. I thought it was an unfair criticism, but that was a perception. And in politics, perception is everything. And so he decides to have a small meeting with the Jewish members of Congress. But it was not in the Oval Office. It was not in the Roosevelt Room. It was not in the Cabinet Room. It was in a fairly unknown conference room in the old Executive Office building. And you know very well that in presidential politics, real estate is everything, <laughs> right? So we're in this conference room in the OEB. And we are having a fairly, well, shall we say, animated conversation. Some would say hostile. And I was quiet because I was all the way at the end. I'm a junior member of Congress. Who cares what I have to say, despite the fact that my name is Israel. And <laughs> the meeting is kind of reaching this pivot, right, where we're either going to figure this out or leave dissatisfied. And the president looks at his watch and he says, it's 10 to 6. At 6 o'clock, I have dinner with my family. So you continue the meeting. I'm going up and having dinner with my family. Now, some would suggest... What awful timing. You have 16, 17 members of Congress. You're trying to get to a resolution, and it's dinner time. That was very meaningful to me because it, I understood his priorities. I knew that members of Congress could wait, but his family couldn't wait. And that instructed me on the values of this president. Maybe not the political positions, but the values uh, of, of this president. Second perspective uh, was uh, on the ACA, Affordable Care Act. Now I have a little bit of seniority, and I find myself invited to more frequent meetings in the White House with the president. I was co completely committed to the bill. And I'm watching my, my fellow members of Congress in tough districts grapple with this, knowing that if they supported Obamacare, they were signing their political death sentences. I saw the polls in their districts guaranteed that if you supported Obamacare, you weren't coming back. And some of them would say, well, it's worth not coming back if I can get health care for my constituents. And others said, I didn't get elected to Congress just to be defeated. And it was pretty tough. Now, there is in this John Lawrence book, and I saw this for myself, interesting dynamic where the president was there as a former senator was deeply invested in lobbying the Senate in bringing senators up to the, to the White House. But in the House of Representatives, many of my colleagues felt that they were unknown, that they were being taken for granted. And there's a famous story after the bill passes. Do you remember that wonderful press conference? I was there, a White House signing ceremony, ceremony. I was there when Vice President Biden leans over to him and says on a hot mic, this is an effing big deal, right? Well, right after that, and this is largely unknown, the president calls Nancy Pelosi to thank her. And she gives him the Pelosi kind of cool treatment. And the president says, and I'm quoting from John Lawrence's book, when she spoke with the president, it was clear her unhappiness had been communicated to him. This is after the biggest victory in recent legislative history. Her happiness had been communicated to him. And the president says, quote, what's your problem with me? But you didn't know that, right? What's your problem with me? And she said, you don't respect the House. What happened? At that bill signing, he forgot to thank House members other than Pelosi. He thanked a bunch of senators. He forgot to thank Congressman George Miller from California, who helped shepherd the bill through, who was close to Pelosi. It's the small things that matter, folks. He forgot to thank George Miller. And she said, you forgot to talk about, you forgot to thank George Miller. And he said, well, I'll send him a thank you note. And she <laughs> said to him, the problem is you don't respect the house. He got the bill passed, but there was still this lingering resentment. Third scene, now I'm in leadership. And the president proposes the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Agreement, with Iran. I was opposed to it, but I was in a bind. I was in House leadership. You can't criticize the president of your party for something when you're in House leadership. And um, he was working me over, working me over. Uh, and uh, he called me to the White House. 
Remember, if you're a rank-and-file member, you rarely get called to the White House. But now I'm in leadership, and he calls me to the White House. And this is one of my worst moments, and I regret it to this day. I ducked him because I knew how unpleasant that would be. And I also thought that the commander-in-chief might make the case that I should vote against my own values and instincts and the interests of my district. And um, this gives you a sense of real inside baseball. He decides to summon the entire House Democratic Caucus to the White House to lobby on Obamacare. I figure, well, you know, there's 200 and what are, I guess 240 of us. I'm in good company. He's not going to single me out. And so I went. But I pulled what some of some Hofstra students may pull, and certainly some of my Cornell students, the old sit in the last row in the back near the door <laughs> trick. So we're in the East Room, and I sat in the last row, last seat by the door, so there would be no eye contact. And John Boehner pulls um, a calculated and unfortunate stunt. There's always an agreement between both parties that when the president, whoever, whatever party the president is in, when the president calls a meeting, you don't schedule votes to interrupt the meeting. And so the President Obama notified the speaker, I'm meeting with the Democratic caucus, and 15 minutes into the meeting, what happens? All of our uh, then pagers, we wore these pagers, remember that? Mm -hmm. They go off indicating that Boehner called a vote intentionally to interrupt the meeting and get us out of the White House so the president couldn't lobby us. And if I could have nominated John Boehner as man of the year at that point, I would have, <laughs> because I got to leave. I got to the floor and I cast my vote with a cocky smile. Ha ha, I don't have to go to the White House. And my dream growing up in Levittown, New York, my dream, was to one day get a message on the floor of the house that the president needed to talk to me. That day I realized what a nightmare that could be. <laughs> he chased me down. And I went into the cloakroom, into a phone booth, and picked it up. And there was the president. And he worked me over for 25 minutes in that phone booth. He said, I want you to come to the White House. I said, Mr. President, you're wasting your time. You're busy. Don't waste your time. I'll find you three undecideds to go to the White House. Isn't that a better deal? And he said, no, I need you. I want you here. And I said, Mr. President, I have to be back in my district. I have an eight o'clock speech at the Heckscher Museum in Huntington. So there's no way I can come to the White House. And God's honest truth, I heard the President of the United States say to me, Steve, I'm the President. I own planes. We can get you there and back. And I did not go, and I should have gone. And I voted against the deal. But this is a president who understood political realities. And at a certain point, he said, okay, I get it. You just can't do it. Not because of the politics. He said, if you told me it was the politics, I would not forgive you. But it's personal. I can't argue with your, with your values and commitment. Just don't announce anything. That's all I ask. I can't have a democratic leader announcing opposition to me. Just keep your mouth shut. And I did it for as long as possible. And now my final story with apologies I went over, with, with okay. apologies. Towards the end of my leadership, I was the chairman of the DCCC. I got to go to the Oval Office three times a year and brief the president and the vice president on house races. In 2000, October of 2000, I'm sorry, summer of 2012, I was on my way to the Oval Office with Speaker Pelosi. And I got the worst call you can imagine from a family member. It was my mom telling me that my dad had been diagnosed that day with terminal lung cancer. And the prognosis was not good. He only had a few months. Uh, and, uh, and now here I am going to the Oval Office. And so I stopped off at the Longworth House Office Building Stationery Store and bought a get well card. My dad worshipped Barack Obama in Phoenix, Arizona. Worshipped Barack Obama. So I get this get well card. And I'm in the car with Nancy Pelosi. We're driving to the White House. And I told her that she starts crying. And I said, well, you know what I did? Um, at that point, Madam Leader, she wasn't a speaker. I said, I got a get well card. I'm hoping the president will sign it. And she kind of says, well, we hope so. Because he did have this reputation for being, shall we say, less than emotional. Right? Uh, very businesslike, official, officious. And at the end of the meeting, I walked up to him. I said, Mr. President, my dad is a huge fan had this uh, tough diagnosis, and I got this greeting card, this get well card, and I was, I was wondering if you would sign it. 
And he looked at me, he gave me that Obama scowl. He said, I'm not signing your card. And I was mortified. Mortified. And then he said, follow me. And he sat behind the Resolute and he pulled out his top drawer and he pulled out some stationery and he wrote a beautiful hand note to my father. Beautiful hand note, which my father framed and hung on his wall to the day he died. To the day he died. Mm. And that showed me that this may have been a president who was famously cool and who would leave meetings with members of Congress to, to have dinner with his family and may not have had a very high regard to lobbying new rank and file members of Congress. But this was a president who had the most important and held the most important value that any president of the United States could hold. And that was humanity, humanity. And above everything else, I hope that this conference will take the time to explore the fundamental humanity of Barack Obama. And I thank you for letting me speak and go a little too long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Israel, for that, those very meaningful stories about President Obama's humanity and, um, and what that means for his leadership and policymaking, which we'll, we'll begin to discuss now. Thank you. Um, I'll now turn it to Dr. Nelson. Mike? When I was told um, that I had 10 minutes to speak to this conference, my memory flashed back to a time some years ago when I was reading through the end of semester course evaluations that students like those in the room fill out. And I came at the bottom of one page to, to a comment. If I had 10 minutes to live, the student wrote, I would choose to spend them in Mr. Nelson's class, which made me feel great until I turned the page and read the, the rest of the comment because in Professor Nelson's class, 10 minutes seems like 10 hours. <laughs> with, with, with any luck, uh, when I'm done today, it won't feel like it's bedtime tonight. Um, students, um, you know, one of the things we do, us gray, gray, gray hairs, um, is pinch ourselves at the start of the semester and, and do a little subtraction. So this year's crop of college students, 18, 20 years old, most of them. Um, when were they born? Well, they, you all were born in, in the mid-2000s, the mid-2010s mid in some cases. And so for, their, for this generation of college students, the idea of an African-American president was what they grew up with. Barack Obama, surely for this generation of college students, is the first presidents of whom they have some sort of living, admittedly childhood memory. And so it may be hard to create among you a sense of just how dramatic uh, a development this was in the history of this country. Um, because for, for, for all of us who, who are a generation or more older and grew up with, with you know, rulers, 12 inch rulers with pictures of all the presidents on them, all 40, three of them, uh, or, or dinner plates with pictures of all those presidents. What it was was a, an unrelenting series of, of white males. Some of them had beards, some of them had mutton chops, but basically all white males. And so for us, this was an event that was clearly transformative. It was a new thing in, in American political history. And it's interesting that it happened in 2008 because 2008 was arguably the first presidential election since 1788, in other words, since the first time George Washington was elected, when in 2008, there wasn't a single presumptive candidate for the presidency who'd been a former president, who'd been a former vice president. The, the, the election in both parties, the competition for the nomination in both parties was as wide open as it has ever been. And so in that environment, when Barack Obama cho chose to run, he was, he, it was a timely moment in his life. It was a timely moment in the nation's life as well. And understand that, that 2008 was about more than Barack Obama in terms of the potential for a historical first. His chief rival for the Democratic nomination was Senator Hillary Clinton 
of New York. So clearly, however, that, co that contest for the nomination culminated, and it was closely fought until the end, the Democratic Party was going to become the first major party in our history to nominate as its candidate for president either a, an African American or a woman. And of course, the Republican Party that year nominated Senator John McCain, a more familiar traditional figure, although he would have been the oldest person ever elected um, uh, had he been chosen. But, but knowing that 2008 was, was not going to be a good year for the Republican Party and that running sort of a, uh, a, an ordinary campaign was going to be a losing proposition, he put on his ticket as his running mate, Governor Sarah Palin of Alaska, meaning that when the voters finally got around to casting their ballots in November, we were either going to have our first black president or our first woman as president. So an interesting year in which think something was going to happen that had never happened before. And of course, what it turned out to be was the election of Barack Obama. How did Obama win? How did he, how did he become the Democratic nominee for president? How did he prevail in the general election? Well, I say that just a few comments about the, the, uh, the contest for the nomination. Obama was in a situation not unlike that of John F. Kennedy almost 50 years before, in 1960, who was bidding to become the first Roman Catholic ever elected as president. This had never happened, and there was sort of a built-in understanding within his own party's leadership that that maybe a Catholic, just for being a Catholic, since it had never happened before, could not get elected. What Kennedy realized was, I've got to go into the, 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 the lion's mouth. I need to go into a state that is overwhelmingly Protestant. And in this case, it was the state of West Virginia in the primary season that year. And show that I can come into a state where the deck is stacked against me and prevail. And he did. Um, Obama realized the same thing about the Iowa caucuses, which is the first event on the presidential calendar, that I'm going to need to show the party that nominating a black man, although it's a risky strategy and that it's never happened before, can be a winning strategy. And by the way, the hesitation among Democrats concerning Obama was not just among white Democrats. It was among black Democrats. The, the Congressional Black Caucus that year was split evenly, as Congressman Israel, I'm sure, knows, between Obama and Hillary Clinton. But Obama went to Iowa. He won. And the signal that sent to the rest of the party, and of course, political party members and leaders want to win elections, was you can nominate this candidate, and he has shown an ability to win votes across the board, across racial lines. And in fact, in November, Obama ended up, according to the exit polls, with 44% of the white vote. Now, that may not seem extraordinary until you realize that in the 10 previous presidential elections, dating back to 1968, Democratic candidates for president, all of whom were white, averaged 39% of the white vote. So if there was ever evidence that Obama could broaden his appeal across racial lines, it was that. In terms of, of, of winning the nomination too, what Obama realized was um, you've got to grind it out. You've got, to, you've got to learn how to play grassroots politics. You know, there were 39 states that year that held primaries, Democratic primaries. Clinton won 20 of them, Obama won 19 of them. Essentially, that was a dead heat. But there were 17 states and, and territories that sent delegates to the Democratic Convention who were chosen in caucuses like the one in Iowa. And what Obama realized and his staff realized, which the, which the Clinton people did not, was you can, you can grind out the victories. It's a matter of, of grassroots organizing. It's a matter of getting people to show up for meetings to participate instead of just casting a secret ballot. And it was in the caucuses. This was just hardball grassroots <clears throat> politics where Obama built his margin over uh, Hillary Clinton and got the nomination. What it showed was that Obama was not just operating at the level of inspiration and hope and change, that he really knew that politics needs to be played at the very practical grassroots level as well as at the sort of 
national inspirational level. Um, one other Kennedy comparison. What Kennedy realized was that it wasn't enough just to win the Democratic nomination and overcome the uh, historical resistance to Roman Catholics. That when it came to the general election, the campaign against the Republican nominee, Richard Nixon, he needed to address a broader audience. And so Kennedy went before another tough crowd, the Greater Houston, Texas Ministerial Association, and made what became the, the most famous speech of his campaign, where essentially he said, you know, if I were, cho if I were chosen, uh, required as president to choose between my faith and my responsibilities as president, I would, I would resign. In other words, he made a he made a pledge that he would he would govern in a way that was um, uh, not dictated by his faith. And if you recall, during that 2000 election campaign, when some very controversial videos of sermons given by the, the Obama's home pastor in Chicago came out, Obama went to the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia and addressed head on the issue of race following the Kennedy playbook, that if there's, if, if there's things out there that people are, are concerned about, even if they're not willing to talk about it explicitly, you've got to address those concerns head on. One other thing about that, that campaign is, is from the John McCain side, the Republican side. John McCain was, was an old school Republican politician. He believed in, in fiscal austerity. He believed in a uh, an, an activist foreign policy. He believed in, in uh, uh, traditional values and so on. Um, but he also believed in, in sort of the basic decency of, of, of a two-party system in which the other party and its leaders and voters need to be respected. And one famous moment from the McCain campaign that fall, which I think in some ways was, it's a tribute to McCain, it's also a sort of foreshadowing of the politics of our day. Uh, he, his favorite campaign style at events was not to give a speech, but to do a town hall. And, he, and he, he went out into the audience and handed the microphone to a woman. And, and the woman stood up and said, and, and you could tell she wasn't used to being in the spotlight, but she said, I can't vote for Obama. I can't trust him. He's an Arab. And McCain's response was, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. He said it four times. He said, Barack Obama is somebody with whom I disagree on the issues, but he's a fundamentally decent human being. Now, to me, that was in itself a great moment of 2008, and one that I'm not sure um, we could count on in a similar campaign um, today or, or in the future to come. So that's what I have to say about 2008. It's, it's a great story. Those of us who live through it will remember it as, as, as a great moment to be alive. And, and for those of you who, who, who know it only as a page out of history, who, but who have a sort of kid's memory of what it was like to learn about the presidency from, you know, the first president who was, who was in office when you were very, very young, and that, that person being Barack Obama. Certainly that, uh, that's an enviable um, moment in life. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. You brought back so many memories uh, of 2008. It, it doesn't seem, it's hard to believe that was 15 years ago. Dr. Perry. Thank you, Mina, and thank you, uh, Madam President and Mr. Provost for having us here at Hofstra, and it is my third presidential conference. Um, I won't take up too much time because I know we want to leave time for discussion, particularly uh, to field your comments and questions from the audience. Um, I have uh, an equally pointed uh, story from a teaching evaluation, though not quite as damning as Mike's, uh, and that was, uh, again, a really good, I thought, evaluation until I got to the open-ended question is there anything else you would like to say about this professor and the student wrote? The, I really like Dr. Perry. The only thing is that when she doesn't know the answer to a question, she makes one up. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I thought that was called making an educated guess, but in any event, <laughs> if anyone asks me a question here over these next few days, I'll just say if I don't know the answer to it. Um, I was proselytized to be a presidential scholar um, starting at age four, if you can believe that. Um, my mother took me to downtown Louisville, Kentucky to uh, attend a John F. Kennedy rally. And until she passed away, she'd say, remember, we got there extra early, and I put you right in front of the podium with your brother so that we could see uh, Senator Kennedy up close and personal. And I'd say, Mother, I was four, so I can't quite remember um, all of the speech, but I just remember the excitement, what a four-year-old would remember, the balloons and the confetti and uh, everybody just cheering. And um, we were in a pretty bipartisan household, so a couple years later, my dad took me to see former President Eisenhower, who was campaigning in Louisville for the midterms in 1962, and being so close by, by being in Louisville to Hodgenville, where Lincoln was born, I was taken there. Uh, and at sort of the height of my belief in Santa Claus when they said, here is the log cabin, and it's kind of like a mini Lincoln memorial from Washington, and then inside is this log cabin, and I was so gullible, I thought that it was actually the cabin where Lincoln was born in this miniature Lincoln memorial, but um, I was told later on that that was just a, a representative representation of a log cabin. But I just remember the, the historical feeling that swept over me in these instances. And so I've, I've counted up of the dozen presidents who've served in my lifetime. I think I've seen here speak in person or actually met them, including having four days with Bill Clinton uh, in, in doing his project for the Miller Center. Four days spent sitting at his dining table on top of the uh, library out at Little Rock. And so I, I get this sense that I, I want to mention to you um, some scholarship that guides me always, and m many of you who are presidency scholars like myself will know the name Jeff Toulis and his book called The Rhetorical Presidency, because when we think of Barack Obama, we think of a great orator, someone who was could really captivate people uh, with his rhetorical skills. Um, and so I, I really think that when you listen to presidents, geez, you could even see in the video that we saw the kinds of charisma that, that he had, the kind of humanity, the self-deprecation that he had that Congressman Israel talked about, and then what he was able to do in really capturing the American imagination. And for that matter, the world's imagination. Remember in 2008 when he went to Berlin and the thousands of people who turned out to see him, um, again, sort of taking us back to the Kennedy years and his speech at the Berlin Wall in 1963. So I'm, I'm thinking about that and about how that rhetorical presidency created, really starting in the 20th century with Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, this view that separates the modern presidency from the founders, which was the founding presidency based on the powers that are in the Constitution or that presidents take on like executive privilege through precedent, starting with George Washington, but that is based in our formal Constitution and the laws passed under it. But since then, that time of the rhetorical presidency, and some have called it the personal presidency, this concept that presidents can reach people directly, that they can go out into the public, especially when transportation becomes modernized, and they can go meet the people directly. Well, I love that. I love to go see a president speak. Um, but does that open up other issues, perhaps? So think in terms of the hope and change theme that Mike talked about and that, that Congressman Israel was a, a part of and now helping to pass that hope and change, um, that agenda that, that Barack Obama had coming into the White House and that he told us that he would be following that agenda in his campaign in, in 08. So think particularly of the Affordable Care Act, um, especially, that, that when that reached people who did not have health insurance or who had reached their lifetime cap uh, on their health insurance coverage or that they had a pre-existing condition that wasn't being covered by uh, health insurance. And you may fall into any of those categories. And so just think what, what hope was given to them by talking about that policy and then actually passing that policy and the change that that brought for the good to many people. The only problem with that personal presidency, so, though, in that hope and change theme is, again, I think to Congressman Israel's point at the beginning, was that if you didn't like the change, 
If you were an American who didn't like the change or where you thought the president, President Obama was taking the country, or if you were hoping for change, but it didn't impact you somehow, it wasn't the change you hoped for, because there were many people who voted for Barack Obama, maybe even twice, and then voted for Donald Trump in 2016, because they apparently felt like that change hadn't come to them in the way that they had hoped. Um, I hope that those are some of the themes that we can discuss. And then one last point that will relate to the paper that my colleague Sheila Blackford and I will be presenting uh, at this time period, the 9.30 slot on Friday, and it's about gender. We've talked about race, of course, but it's about gender and Barack Obama and what he did to promote women uh, in his presidency into his advising positions, the senior positions, the cabinet positions, two positions on the Supreme Court, but also the policies, including ACA, that had a tremendous and positive impact uh, on women. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and say I'm also happy to talk about um, the oral histories that we do of presidential administrations and how that helps us both to preserve the legacies of presidents, but also to judge them as well as time goes by. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Perry, especially for squeezing in so many points. <laughs> and hopefully we'll, we'll get to continue in the discussion. So Dr. Hemelfarb and I are teaching a seminar together on the presidency. We, on the Obama presidency, we have prepared about a dozen questions. I think Dr. Hemelfarb, I will turn to you, maybe to ask one to the group, and then maybe I'll get one in, and then we'll, we're going to try to get in at least a couple of student questions. Okay. So please. Okay, thank you. It's, it's uh, wonderful to be sitting on a panel with so many um, knowledgeable and uh, distinguished people. Um, my question concerns, you know, Obama's appeal in 2008. And um, of course, it was all embodied in this uh, term, hope and change. Um, but I'd like each of the panelists, if possible, to think, to speak about what exactly did that mean to American voters in 2008? Um, what did that mean in practice in 2008? Was it a a promise to unite the country? Was it a promise to move beyond race? Or was it more um, uh, of a, a sort of enacting a progressive agenda? Or was it all of that stuff? Well, I'll, I'll jump in to, uh, at first to say that I think as uh, Professor Nelson was pointing out about uh, the, the links between Obama and President Kennedy, and that I, I've got a campaign button at home from 2008 that has a picture of the two men. And of course, famously in his inaugural address in 1961, President Kennedy talked about the torch being passed to a new generation. President Kennedy wasn't only the first Roman Catholic to be at the top of a major ticket and win, um, and be successful, but he also was the first president born in the 20th century, and he pointed that out in his inaugural address as well. So I think that that generational shift is what Barack Obama was talking about in terms of change. Um, we also have to remember that, that there had been two terms for Bush 43, and that we were um, immersed in two wars um, in Afghanistan and Iraq that people were turning against, particularly the war in Iraq. Um, the economy was collapsing, and as we said, in the midst of that campaign, to the point where, as Congressman Israel said, we were that close to going off the cliff into another Great Depression. And so the combination of that, and then I think if you put up against Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, um, who is at the leading edge of the baby boom generation, whereas Barack Obama is at the last edge of the baby boom generation. So that's people born between 46 and 64. Um, that difference, that generational difference between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and the facts that she supported the two wars, particularly the Iraq war, and he was uh, not supporting it, um, that was a, a huge difference. Uh, and I think that the, how they presented themselves on the campaign trail, that Barack Obama had that, that quality, that in some ways it's if you could bottle it and sell it, you'd be a billionaire. Um, but he's charismatic. He draws people to him. And certainly Hillary Clinton did with, with um, the gender issue and, and female followers. But I think the combination of, again, Barack Obama's positive attributes and the fact that my sister-in-law, for example, said that she and my brother could not vote for Hillary Hillary Clinton because they didn't want to see the Clintons back in the White House. And, and I couldn't help myself. I said, what was it exactly 
about the peace and prosperity of the 1990s that you didn't like, but I knew exactly what she meant, and that was the scandals um, surrounding uh, President uh, Clinton. So that's my thought of how the hope and change theme worked to the benefit uh, of Barack Obama in 2008. Obama was not the first um, African-American political figure to seek uh, his party's nomination. Uh, Shirley Chisholm uh, uh, in, early, in an earlier election, Jesse Jackson. Um, but they were candidates who, who focus on issues that were of particular concern to the black community, urban issues, poverty issues, racial justice issues. Uh, Barack Obama really didn't do that in 2008. He, he talked about tax cuts for the middle class. He talked about um, uh, health care. And in particular, he talked about, and, and he had the luxury of, of not being in the Senate when the vote was taken in 2002 to authorize the use of military force in Iraq. He was able to talk about the fact that, that as a state senator in Chicago, he had spoken out against the war at a time when Senator Hillary Clinton, for example, uh, Senator John Kerry, thinking of their political future and not knowing how unpopular the war would become, voted for the authorization of force. Uh, Obama, in a sense, made it safe for white people to vote for a black candidate by not putting racial issues at the forefront of his campaign. You know, his famous debut on the national stage at the 2004 Democratic Convention, when his whole theme was, there's not a black America, there's not a white America, there's not a red America, there's not a blue America. E pluribus unum, there's, there's a United States of America. Um, so I, I have no doubt that he was aware that, that in 2008, he was asking voters to do something that they had never done before, and that is vote for a candidate who was not uh, a white man. But he also knew that, uh, um, that letting them know that he shared a concern about issues that weren't particular to um, his race was going to be essential to, to, to getting them to uh, uh, break free from those historic patterns and, and vote for him. And it's not insignificant that Obama was essentially raised in, in, in Hawaii um, and was raised by his, his white grandparents and, and went, to a, went to school in Honolulu that was a mostly white school. He went to Occidental College and then Columbia University and Harvard Law School. He knew how to operate in, in a diverse environment that, that, that was mostly white. And so I think he realized that, that how you, as a, a, as a different kind of face in, in, in these different settings, how you a, are able to connect with people on the basis of what you have in common rather than uh, underscoring the ways in which you are different in their minds. That's a life skill that he had been developing since early childhood. I think you have to bifurcate the answer to your question. Um, uh, hope and change had different meanings to a Democratic primary electorate versus a general election electorate. I think the Democratic Party wanted a strong, vivid, defiant repudiation of George Bush and Dick Cheney. A less corporate repudiation. They viewed the Clintons and the Democratic Leadership Council as corporatist. They wanted something completely different. And that is what helped Barack Obama defeat Hillary Clinton in the primary. The general election was, was, was different uh, to Pro Professor Perry's point. Number one, with some exception, Americans tend to want to stay the course with a president unless the president is catastrophic. And so it's two years and then we switch. Two, I'm sorry, two terms and then we switch. So eight years, two terms uh, of uh, the Bush administration, people were, they tend to just want change after that period of time. Number two, the, the two most important trackers in all of the polling that we were looking at in 2008 from, from the perspective not of scholars but practitioners were the economy, how is the economy doing? And the war. The big problem Democrats had until roughly 2006 was that we consistently lost on the national security issue. Republicans were branded as stronger 
on national security. Because of how Iraq was doing, for the first time in several decades, Democrats had reached parity with Republicans on management of national security. And that opened the door for general election voters to say, I'll t I want economic change, and I'm not going to feel less safe with a Democratic president. Those convergences helped explain Obama's success in the general election. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, um, and then we'll open it up. Because the three of you have spoken so movingly about Barack Obama's, President Obama's humanity, um, Representative Israel discussed that with his four very compelling illustrations. Professor Nelson talking about the grassroots politics, how Obama prevailed in 2008 through and with the caucuses and building up, mobilizing a force from uh, the ground up in support. And then Dr. Perry talking about the personal presidency, how Obama was able to make, President Obama was able to make these connections with people through his skills as a communicator. And we see how those qualities brought Obama to the White House and the significance of his election in 2008. What do those skills tell us about his presidential leadership? And in particular, political scientists and historians talk about transformational versus transactional presidents, right? Presidents who work within the boundaries of the existing political system and presidents which is typical, and then those few presidents who are able to really reshape or reorient the direction of American politics. The expectations were for Obama in 20, 2008 to be transformational. How, how, did he, how did his leadership skills bring him toward that goal, and why or why didn't he succeed? Well, when, you know, when we talk about transformational presidents in history, it, it's, we usually talk about them in terms of the dramatic changes that occurred uh, in, in response to their leadership, the way in which things were, the things that happened because they were particularly effective leaders at a particularly hospitable time. To me, the, the great accomplishment of the Obama presidency was the Great Depression that did not happen but which was in the course of happening when he first took office. Again, it's so hard to recapture um, for those who, who don't remember the time, just how precarious our economy was when essentially our financial system collapsed. And this began during the latter months of the George W. Bush presidency, and it continued into the, um, into the Obama president. It's what he inherited and had to deal with. And, uh, um, you know, like the dog that didn't bark in uh, the Sherlock Holmes mystery turning out to be the most important clue to solving the murder. To me, the depression that didn't happen because Obama and the Democratic Party in Congress um, pumped enough money into the economy uh, in various forms to, to, to sort of stabilize the patient so that the slow process of economic recovery could begin and the depression that didn't happen. Now, how do, you, what do you, how do you claim credit for something that doesn't happen? Um, I think it's the hardest thing to do that persuasively. But to me, that's what stands out. And I'll just tell you one story from, again, from my vantage point in Memphis, Tennessee, when in March of 2009, uh, early in the Obama presidency, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average had fallen down below half of its peak, was down to, to 6,500. And, and our, one of our coaches at Rhodes College came to me and just out of randomly, Mike, what do I do? I want to retire. Um, can I afford to? Do I, do, I, do I cash in my portfolio, my retirement savings? at six? Because none of us knew at that moment where the bottom was. And, 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 and of course it didn't, that was the bottom, <laughs> but, but not because you know, um, of any financial genius on Wall Street, it's because the Obama administration supported by his party in Congress did what needed to be done in that moment. Can I give you a real life example? Another real life example of, of, of where aspiration and humanity clashes with the fundamental problem of a whip count. 
meaning how many votes do you have to get something passed? And it is relevant to the conversation about the economy. The administration realized at that moment when everything was collapsing that there needed to be an economic stimulus. And all of the president's advisors, this alone will be a book one day. All of the scholars, the academics, and the economists around the table had calculated that for a stimulus to work, it needed to be $1.6 trillion minimally. And I was on the appropriations committee at the time. We were the people who were going to write the check. And we're in negotiations. And, the, and President Obama said, we got to do 1.6. This is what the experts are telling me. This is what the professionals are saying. Put the politics aside. It's got to be $1.6 trillion. And the initial whip count showed that there was not nearly enough votes to get to 1.6 trillion. And that's when the negotiations began and it dropped to 1.3 trillion and 1.2 trillion in real time and a trillion and 900 billion. And now people are saying it's a waste of money. It's not going to work. It's not going to work unless it's 1.6 trillion. And it ends up at something around 800 billion, 800 billion. And the White House staffers, when we, 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 have these conversations with them and say, why are we settling for 800 billion? People aren't going to feel it fast enough. We're in a re-election, we're in a midterm election. Democrats need, can't show shovel-ready projects. They've got to show bridges. They've got to show things built. And this isn't going to seep into the economy fast enough. And the president rightly understood that if he was gonna get 218 votes in the House, and if he was going to get 51 votes in the Senate and maybe even higher based on reconciliation, which we won't, I won't bore you with, at a certain point, you have to suspend your aspirations, your political priorities and get the best deal that you can. And so the deal ended up being around 800 billion. What happens? 2010, Democrats lose 63 seats in the House. There's a new Tea Party majority in the Congress. Two years later, Barack Obama gets reelected fairly comfortably. Why? Because by 2012, voters felt the change. Mm -hmm. They saw the new roads. The money had seeped into the economy. The reality worked for President Obama's reelection. Thank you. Let's hear from our audience. Okay. Let's thank you. Um, let's open the floor. We have some time for questions, and we have microphones on either side. We'd love to hear from one of our students if someone would like to come to the microphone. Extra credit. <laughs> A student from our seminar. Please, Justin, go ahead. Um, I'm Justin. I'm in uh, Professor Bose's and Himmer, Professor Himmer Farber's class. Um, yesterday, we were talking about how Obama was going to be the transformational president similar to change a generation, similar to FDR, and kind of establish a new um, realignment in the uh, in the uh, in government politics. And I, got, I saw a lot of similarities between FDR and Obama, um, their charisma, the, uh, the state in which they had to take office, the depression that they both had to take over and uh, solve. But one thing that I never kind of understood was why doesn't Obama get as much, you know, um, I would say credit for his role in sol not solving, but addressing the recession in the same way that FDR did after his 100 days and the New Deal? Great question. So your question, Justin, is why doesn't Obama get uh, as, as much credit as FDR for yeah. turning the economy around? Well, I think it's uh, Professor Nelson answered that in part, which was, uh, thank goodness we didn't go off the cliff and go into the Great Depression. Uh, and so it's a little bit harder, I think, to make that case. It's, it, it's, it's a case to be made, but it doesn't stand in history as quite the same. And also remember for FDR, elected four times, um, is also viewed as um, the, the great victor with our allies in World War II. So he has that on, on top of which. I see you have a follow-up. Oh, I was about to ask. So would you argue that Obama's preventative measures versus FDR's, like, like his um, reactive measures, you would argue that his reactive measures were more, like, impactful? Or would you say it was more, like, significant? That's good. You want to take that? Well, you know, FDR, from the standpoint of having uh, the, the political climate perfectly aligned 
for, for a president to come in and get the sort of dramatic transformational legislation that FDR got during the, the first 100 days and throughout his first term. The situation has to really be, be desperate, yeah. where people are saying, you know, do, wherever you want to lead us, we will follow. And 25 percent of the yeah. people are unemployed when FDR comes in. From a crass political standpoint, Obama's problem was he didn't have that kind of opportunity because the country had not sunk into depression. Not yet. Okay. And and so you know, I, obviously he didn't. He, he, it's not something he would have wished. I'll say this though, and and you know, in addition to me arguing that his averting what seemed like it was going to be a depression ought to be up there on Mount Rushmore. Um, the Affordable Care Act was not nothing. I mean, every Democratic president, starting with Harry Truman, and even Richard Nixon, a Republican, had tried to get something in the way onto the books in the way of something approaching national health insurance. And Obama did it. And he did it in a much more um, polarized political environment yeah. than any of his predecessors had faced long partisan lines. So once again, I think that there we've got a scalp on the wall, so to speak, that that <laughs> Obama's presidency can can claim to have, to have put there. Justin, I, you know, this this um, question was often posed to President Obama uh, yeah. at events where people say, why can't you be Roosevelt, be Johnson? And his response <laughs> was always, I would love to be. All I need is the Democratic majorities that FDR and Roosevelt, that yeah, uh, FDR yeah, and Johnson had in the House and the Senate. People forget he was a president with a working majority in the House and Senate for two out of his eight years. That was it. The other six years, he had a proactively hostile Republican majority that announced openly that their number one goal was to stop Obama from succeeding, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. That is a matter of fact. And so you can't get everything that you want done when you have a group of people who are sworn to your failure right. without any, any fidelity. And then two other quick things. FDR did not have social media and he did not have Fox News or MSNBC. That's a good and point. so cable television <laughs> and social media have completely changed the environment in which presidents can succeed. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. All right, we have two more questions. I think if, we, if they're quick and we get maybe a quick answer, we'll try to get them both. Go ahead. Thank you all for being here. Um, this question is specifically for Congressman Israel. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned as a high-ranking member you felt you could not go against President Obama. Do you feel this limited the ability to govern in any way? It's a great uh, question. I'll, I'll be very succinct. Uh, it's not that I felt that I couldn't go against him. I did vote against him. It was the optics of going against him. You could vote against him as long as, number one, you had a good explanation, and number two, you did it quietly. Uh, and so having the, the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee go on MSNBC and announce voted that I was going to vote against the president on the Iran deal meant that other undecided Democrats were had had uh, a way to vote against it uh, as well because look the chairman is doing it so we can too and so it was a matter really I, I will confess of, of of stage management vote against him he was okay with it not happy okay with it Pelosi was not okay and not happy. Um, but you can do it so long as it wasn't in a, in a, in a way that was completely destructive to his uh, agenda. Do you feel it limited the ability to govern, though, in any way? I'm sorry, my, uh, the president's uh, ability to govern or? Congress, the president, in any way? No, because at the end of the day, he, he got the bill passed. Uh, and so there is kind of a sense of, uh, I, you, I know what you have to do. You can do it so long as it doesn't cost me votes at the end of the day. And that is a political skill uh, that led to decent governance. Thank you. So even though you opposed it, that by not speaking about it, it didn't cost votes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Please, go ahead. So as mentioned earlier, this question is more geared towards Mr. Israel. As mentioned earlier, you all now you all express a great reverence for Obama's humanity, citing references to family dinners, citing references to letters, and general commitment. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that transcended just his personal character and went into being a leader for not only the country in general, but also how that impacted his policy making in general. 
Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. I know my colleagues on the panel have their own perspectives. I, again, will be succinct. You know, there's a saying that in, in politics, it's never personal. It's always business. Wrong. <laughs> it's always personal. Always. Politicians are politicians because they have egos. They actually believe that they can end world hunger and create world peace and expand the economy and make investments so that our children can grow up in a safe and strong country. They have egos. President Obama, and I'll tell you, Pre President Bush had this skill as well. They understood the personal. President Bush understood that if you, if he invited you to watch a baseball game in the residence, that on a vote where you could go either way, there was no cost back home, and it didn't defy your principles, on a vote where he really needed you as a Democrat, but it wasn't a tough vote, you'd go with him. Why? Because he invited you a game and he had a personal relationship and he would ask about your children and he would ask about your district. President Obama, as I said before, I think less, and I don't mean this as a criticism at all because he was so effective, less of an investment in using the White House to achieve, as a personal platform, to achieve his goals, more about the policy. Uh, and more strategic. I shouldn't have been invited to see baseball games with George W. Bush. I was a Democrat who hardly anybody knew. Few rank and file members, Democrats, were invited to the White House unless they were in a position where they could ad help advance the, the president's agenda on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Well, I think we see here that we are start, we have started what is going to be a highly intense, thought-provoking, and instructive series of discussions. Please join me in thanking our three panelists for their commentary.